the um, succinct background of, a group of the Green Funders Forum, which has been on and off uh, around since 2003 when she started it. I want to do a call out to Elishev and Dorit, who after uh, Jay Chauffet and then the Green Environment Fund um, that they were, that uh, Sigal was running, disbanded. So Dorit and Elishev jumped in to take over and we met for quite a few years uh, at, at Heinrich Boll. Um, and now we are, as uh, Sigal said, trying to uh, reinvigorate. Um, we're still a work in progress. We appreciate everybody's involvement, ideas, suggestions, interest in uh, and helping to plan various meetings and sessions. Um, there's a lot to cover. And I think one of the biggest things that's really important to us is that although most of us sitting here would define ourselves in some way as a green funder, there are many people now, especially as environmental issues have become much more prominent, um, whether they be environment, you know, specific environmental issues or things that, that become connected to the economy and to education and to kids at risk and to Arab Jewish relations. There's a, there's a sustainability lens that focuses on everything that we do. Um, and I, we, we're very pleased that there are more and more funders who are interested in trying to, um, trying to adapt a sustainability lens in terms of their, their own funding. And so we welcome you here and to invite more people and we look forward to other opportunities to, uh, to learn together. And I will get off. Marla, why don't you take over and describe this meeting? Okay, one second, we're just gonna share the screen. Um, oh, so I'm looking at this. They see this. Oh, you see this, okay. Do you see it? Do you guys see the shared screen? Yeah, if you want it to be full screen, press the, as if you're presenting the PowerPoint presentation. Exactly, slideshow. Good, okay. Okay, so um, all of us on this call are philanthropists, and I think probably most of us, in addition to our philanthropy, also uh, have an endowment or a foundation or some kind of investment account, charity accounts. And we also have investments in addition to that. Um, as a philanthropist, we are looking for NGOs that align with our values. And when Gideon and I became philanthropists, we definitely did a strategic process to really find out like which values we wanted to emphasize in our philanthropy. And what we personally decided on was two streams of giving. So we wanted the stream of human rights and democracy and also a stream on the environment. Now, once we decided on that strategic process, and Seagal was uh, very helpful, thank you, um, we then wanted to continue to strategize and map the field, and I'm sure this is, rings true for all of you. We wanted to look for NGOs that use the strategy that we believed in, which is mostly advocacy and grassroots organizing. Um, we did a mapping to find which NGOs not only aligned with our values, but had reasonable strategies, reasonable um, work plans and projects to reach their goals. Did they have a realistic budget? Um, but we also wanted to make sure that the NGOs that we give grants to are well run internally. Do they have good management policies? Are their salaries um, of their employees, are in they some kind of a reasonable hierarchy? So that Ah, we don't, they don't want that one? Okay. You see both the slides? Okay. Yeah, you can enlarge it so we only see one. Okay. 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 Okay, um, okay, so I can do that. Okay, so where was I? Um, okay, so I was also just saying like when we're vetting NGOs, we're also concerned not only the goals that they're trying to reach, but also how they're managing themselves internally. Um, why don't we just stop sharing? Stop sharing. Um, you want me to share the presentation, Marla? No, I think we're just gonna just 
Let's do it. Take that off. Okay. Um, they can still see the screen. It, just let me. Sorry. Um, okay, it's not critical. My part is really not critical. Um, okay. So I think all of us want to make sure that the employees are being treated well at the NGO, that the salaries are commensurate, that the, the, the director is not receiving an outrageous salary while everybody else isn't. Um, do they have a good board of directors? Are they steering the organization? And all of these are really coming true, especially now during this crisis. The NGOs need to make it, and the NGOs that are well run are the more likely to make it. And I'm bringing this forward because I think that this is going to hold true for our investments as well. I think there are some real parallels here. Um, now, with all of that, um, our philanthropy, and with all due respect to Gideon's hard work and uh, helping the company reach an IPO, um, our philanthropy is a fraction of our overall net worth. And so if you have an endowment, um, for our, in our case, personally, I had a nice pie chart, but for our case, we actually dedicated 25% of our entire net worth to philanthropy. Um, there you go, there's a pie chart. 25% <laughs> to philanthropy. Um, but we want to be perpetual. So within our endowment, like most of you, we're giving away about 5%. Actually more this year between the elections and Corona, we gave away, we're giving away more. Um, but of course that leaves the other part of our endowment and then the bigger blue part is the rest of our investments so we give away five percent of our endowment but when you translate that into our entire net worth it's only it's about one percent of the total so we think with all of with in our philanthropy that we have had a real strategic process and that we are having an impact but what about the rest of the pie and you can go to the next uh, slide Seagal I think Okay, how do we invest uh, the 99% to have real impact and can we have oversight and the same due diligence that we do in philanthropy? Um, so uh, you can go to the next slide. So I became very interested, almost obsessed with where our money was invested. And I back up to say that in the introduction, when we went around, I said that we became philanthropists and investors literally at the same time in 2014 because of uh, Mobileye, the company that Gideon works for. So um, when philanthropy was something that was very, uh, something I felt very safe with because I have a master's degree in public policy and all of my work experience in the US and a lot in Israel was in the nonprofit sector. So I knew about 501c3 and 46 Aleph and evaluation and report writing and networking and fundraising. I knew that world really well. But when it came to investing our money, I had a lot of questions to ask. Um, so when I went to our investment managers, and I, I grew up in Kansas City, so we had a bank account in Kansas City and we have a bank account in Jerusalem. I went to Kansas City and I was kind of mortified to find out that a lot of our individual stocks and our, um, you can go back actually, our individual stocks and our, um, and our funds were made up of stocks that were heavily polluting and also had human rights abuses and in everything from privacy to even child labor. Okay, Stigal, next slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I saw was that our philanthropy and our investments were literally at cross purposes, the exact opposite of our values that we were trying to bring forward in our philanthropy. And um, I decided to really step up and try to make sure that um, that I was going to do something about this because after all we want to do good not just with our 1% of philanthropy that's 1% of annual giving but we want to do good with the rest of the pie as well but at the same time we want to make a profit so um, I started asking a lot of questions and when I brought this up with the banker in Kansas he literally said to me 
Marla, just trust us. We will make you a lot of money and then you'll give away more money and that's where your values will come in. I mean, this is almost word for what, word for what he said. And then I came to the banker in Jerusalem and you can imagine, right? He said, um, we only know about making profit. We can't ex be expected to know about company behavior and carbon footprint. I don't know anything about that and that is not my job. Then um, I went to the investment committee of uh, our endowment sits in a donor advised fund. So I went to the investment committee and I had high hopes because after all, this was part of my philanthropy. And they said, no, responsible investment. First of all, we don't really know what you're talking about, but that is entirely too risky. We are going to stick with exclusively government bonds. So that was the original reaction about five years ago. And I literally took this on as a dare. I said, I, this, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. And I went from being in total disconnect from what was happening with our investments to being a crusader in wanting to align our values with not only our philanthropy, but also in our endowment and the rest of our investments. And at the same time though, we definitely wanted market returns or better. So can we actually bring our values to our investments and make money? And the answer is yes. And I'm going to tell you from personal experience, I have been involved with this for five years now, and I've learned that the status quo is not the only way. And here is the update. Um, I, it took me a year of lobbying the investment committee of the donor advised fund. And after a year of meetings and lectures and uh, reporting, et cetera, it came to a vote of whether or not the Stein family fund was allowed to do responsible investing. And one investment committee member said, absolutely not. I'm not gonna put my, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna let you do that. And I said, okay, I'm going to spend down our fund. We're not going to be perpetual. In two or three years, that's the end of the fund. And guess what? <laughs> the, in, the donor spoke and the investment committee voted for responsible investing for our fund. And um, because of that, our fund actually became the very first client of IBI's responsible investment fund. I now actually sit on the investment committee and Gideon and I opened a personal account in IBI's responsible fund as well. Um, and I'm just giving you that example because if you're persistent, you can make the change. The Kansas banker called me about a year ago and said, guess what Marla, we now have a budget to buy a database. Well, you need a database in order to do responsible investing. And I was, I was delighted. And so now he's incorporating responsible investing in our portfolio there. And they're able to now to also offer that um, service to other clients. The Jerusalem Bank has been a little bit more difficult. But in fact, in the last few months, they have actually now hired a consultant to evaluate, evaluate how they can move forward on responsible investing. And in addition to all of that, um, Gideon and I have actually helped um, uh, found Value Squared, which is a responsible investment fund in global public equity. So I have um, kind of really lived this learning curve. And I can really now proudly say that our investments are well on the way to being aligned with our values. And I really just want to hopefully encourage you in this call to let you know that you too can make this change not only for your own uh, portfolios but by doing this the the whole corporate world will change as well when investors speak the corporates listen if we want a reduced carbon footprint if we want sustainable goods and services they are going to move to meet these demands and I've seen it on the personal level, and the more investors that get involved in responsible investing, we are going to see a change in the ecosystem. Um, 
So we all need to get educated on these topics. You need to review your portfolios, not only your individual stock holdings, but what's in your ETFs. You need to ask your investment manager for real solutions, not just greenwashing solutions. And there are a lot of greenwashing. Uh, there are a lot of funds out there that are really only impact in name only. So you need to be careful about that. And you need to bring your philanthropic skills to the table. So the due diligence that you do with your NGOs, you need to bring those same skills to your investments. And with all of that, you should be able to get true impact and market or better than market returns. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Ella to, and Noga after that to tell us in fact how we can do that. Okay, but um, Sigal, I think that Ella wants to now put hers up. Ella is actually controlling the presentation, it's fine. It's not me. <laughs> oh, thanks Sigal. Um, okay, so um, the first take home message, I think that everyone understood is don't argue with Marla. Um, and if you want something, you better uh, be cooperative. Um, I will say that um, I was on the board of uh, Mala, which is uh, the Israeli um, ESG or SRI uh, NGO that monitors uh, corporates in Israel, probably for 10 years um, without being able to incorporate this in any major way into IBI until a client came and uh, and then suddenly everything that couldn't be done before was uh, possible. Um, I put up a disclaimer because I do work in an investment house and so if I do mention any particular stock or bond, obviously we might have a conflict of interest and this is not um, an advisory session in any way. Um, so basically what Marla was saying and I think most of us uh, try to live by this rule is that uh, we really want our values um, to be depicted in everything we do. Um, and then we have these portfolios where it's not necessarily possible. So this is just the standard American portfolio. Um, Israeli uh, portfolios have a lot less equity in them. Um, but for a standard portfolio, obviously, uh, the amount of money that could have an impact, could have a positive impact, could be working alongside your values and making a profit at the same time is really substantial, both in the equity and in the bond market. Any corporate uh, type of niarerich um, obviously uh, can be more impactful. Um, so just to show you that uh, this is not just wishful thinking, but most uh, analysis that that um, compared um, ESG monitored portfolios with just regular uh, portfolios did a lot better. Uh, this is over 2,000 uh, different studies, and you can see the green is one uh, portfolios that uh, um, outperformed the market, and uh, the yellow were neutral, so they didn't do um, they didn't do better, but they did as well as uh, normal portfolios or regular portfolios. Um, when you when you talk to portfolio managers, their first reaction is, "Listen, managing money, other people's money, is difficult enough, and you want to reduce my universe of choice uh, and have me choose from a smaller uh, group of, of stocks and bonds." So basically, you're putting me in the game with my hands tied behind my back. And obviously, we don't want to do that. And the answer to that is really, that's not true. We're looking at the general portfolio, and we're using a very uh, powerful tool. Um, we call it best in class. Basically, we say that the tools that the ESG monitoring gives us are tools that allow us within each industry 
uh, to choose the best managed companies. So the, the companies that are able to outperform financially and on top of that outperform on their ESG um, uh, criteria are obviously better managed than any other company. So it's theoretically or not theoretically, practically, it is very simple to find the companies that are best in class, that are best managed in each industry. And so basically what we're saying is we're not reducing the universe. We're looking at exactly the same universe, only we're using very powerful tools to choose uh, those companies within them. So basically each investment ideas go, idea goes through a, a funnel. And you know, I, graphically you could describe the funnel any way you want, but practically, the funnel, the way it works is that uh, we view um, the universe. We think, okay, coronavirus, we don't want to be in tourism. Uh, we might want to be in finance. We might want to be in um, agriculture. We want, maybe we like e-commerce or whatever, okay? So we view the, the universe. Um, we choose the industries we want to be active in. Uh, we obviously choose the extent uh, of stocks, bonds, geographies, and so on. And then we um, evaluate each investment ideas, idea through uh, two um, spectrums. One is their financials, and the other is their ESG. Or, Hello. Um, Hello, maybe just to yeah. define what ESG is for those who maybe are so, unclear on the term. Uh, ESG stands for um, Environment, Social, and Governance. And Nogu is going to talk a lot more about this in a second. So I will um, just conclude this part of the, of the talk by saying that everyone, all the investment world uh, is looking through this lens. And the reason that they're doing this now and they haven't been doing this five or 10 years ago, and Marla, you just came just in time, uh, very good timing into this market, is that really the tools that allow us to do this, uh, sort of uh, the glasses or, or just the data that is out there that allows us to do the screening, um, wasn't there um, five or 10 years ago. And it's very, um, it, it's, it's both out there now, every major uh, data provider, uh, Moody's, S&P, Bloomberg, and so on, they all provide this kind of information. And so it's really a lot easier for any investment manager uh, to do this. And um, in the end, we'll say a few words about what, what the difference is and um, what kind of screening you might wanna do uh, when you choose between these uh, investment managers. So, Noga, do you want me to stop share? Noga, you have to unmute. Noga, you're muted. That's okay. it. Sorry. Okay. Uh, but it's not Noga, do you want to allow to stop sharing? You'll share or should we, will we continue stop. on purpose? No. Ella, you need to stop sharing. Sorry. Okay. Did I mention my husband works for a tech company? but we're still challenged. Wow, we did it. Okay. So it's fine. No, but you see this thing. Ah, you don't see it. Okay, Ella, you'll do it. Ella, <laughs> Ella, Ella. Ella. and now here, we learned how to uh, do it. Okay. Now we did it. Okay, sorry. And in order for me not to see myself, I'm going to close the, how do you do it? Yeah. Okay. Just no, just close this, this, close this, this. sorry. Because another one. Okay, okay, let's stick to it. Okay, okay. so uh, well, how do we do investing in responsible investment right? Uh, in responsible investments, we aim to find the most financially excellent companies that are delivering impact and values. But what does it mean to uh, impact. First of all, screening out products that, are, that offend our values. 
Second, is we don't want to invest, we want to invest only in companies with high ESG scores that are sustainable, fair and honest. Then we want companies that derive revenue from creating goods and services for a better world. But we also want to monitor those companies 24 seven for controversies to ensure that they are not getting into trouble. For instance, let's take Facebook. Uh, we need to consider again whether we want it in our portfolio because they have in one year more than 120 controversies, some of which are severe and ongoing. But let's understand a bit more in more detail. Screening is what most of us think about when we speak about responsible investing. Negative screening means not to invest in companies that are involved in weapon, tobacco, animal testing, fossil fuel, and that's only a fraction of what you can screen out. This is to ensure we are not financing those activities that are not aligned with our values. But screening is only a gatekeeper. The challenging part is now to choose the best sustainable, honest, and fair companies. Here you can see a chart. It's from, uh, we'll speak about the company that does it later, but for what we need in order to understand the ESG, we need to understand the company's environmental, social, and governance behavior. By examining the business behavior, we are actually examining the risk management of the companies. Companies that are leading, uh, are leading according to those parameters are likely to manage their risks. It is important to stress that we are researching all companies on all those factors, all sectors, and not just companies whose core business has to do with environment like renewable energy or waste management companies. This is because all companies have employees, supply chain, and companies, all of them have governance. In the social aspects that you see in the center part, you can see that we are, we, in order to understand the companies, we, we don't want to, we don't want to invest in companies that allow employees, that are not allowing their employees to take breaks and which treat their, their employees well so they have loyalty. They are flexible in allowing, their, in allowing their employees to work from home sometimes and are very serious in how they're taking care of the client's privacy and the data they have. Under the G sector, we can see that it's the blue, it includes behavior, business behavior, and corporate governance. We want to know how diversified is the board? How many women? Is the board president also the CEO? And are there ridiculous bonuses for executives? Is there a corruption? Companies that score well on the S and the G are managing their risks and more likely to be able to adjust themselves to these changes. But let's now go and look at the E category that we can see in the, in the green column. In the, in, in the environment category, we want to see how these companies are managing in their environment impact. Do they have environmental strategy? Do they, do they transport their products in an efficient way? Are they moving to clean energy? How are they affecting the biodiversity around them? Are they wasting water in their plants? Disposable packaging. We're not talking about recycling their disposable papers, although that could be nice, but we are talking about major environmental footprint. Again, this is relevant to all companies that have an environmental impact, manufacturing, Bathing suits, yogurt, or wind turbines. All companies need to score high in these categories. But in order to avoid greenwashing, we need to ask them specific questions, not yes or no questions. For example, let's take the issue of impact of product use and disposal. 
um, let's look at this. This is a sh uh, this is a information on a shoe company. We want to know. Uh, we want we want to know what they do in sustainable packaging. So Visual Iris, and we are giving an example of Visual Iris, is an example of a very thorough database. It is a research company with more than 30 years of experience, 150 analysts, and that, uh, that um, analyze more than 5,000 companies. Visual Iris has just bought Moody's, the famous credit rating company that Ella uh, mentioned a couple of minutes ago. Let's see how Visual Iris deals with ESG data. Here is a snapshot of Nike and how they measure up on sustainable packaging. This entire slide is about the subcategory of sustainable packaging. If you can see, the company scores well in some measures and in some they don't. For example, they don't have a program for taking back their packaging. Based on all of this, the company gets a score of a, and evaluation on sustainable packaging, which is 43. You can see it on the top. This all affects their final grade, um, which we can see here. This is the this ESG summary slide. From this database, uh, we know the over, that the overall score is 38. And they are, here you can see their rank, they are in the seventh best out of 66 in, the, 66 in their sector. You can see here, on the right, you can see here their grades in E, S, and G compared to their sector average, 25, 25, and 42. Um, note that while the profile is being done once a year, the company is monitored 24 seven for controversies to ensure that they are not getting into trouble. Bottom line, having the level of detail is important, not just to feel good, about our investment, but also because we want to know how the company is handling risks. The higher the risk score, the lower, uh, the higher the ESG score, the lower the risk. If you don't pollute, you won't get fired. While ESG is our tool to assess the risk management, the sustainable development goals is a tool that allows us to see which companies are using opportunities. The sustainable uh, development goals that you can see here are 17 goals that the UN has decided that all sectors need to work for in order to create a better world by 2030. These goals have become a, ro became a roadmap for investors. We as investors want to know how much of the company's revenue is going toward providing sustainable goods and services toward solving the SDGs. In this category, the company not only uh, can make an impact on the world, but most critical for most critical problems, but they also have a business opportunity because a lot of the world's investments are going into the, the, this direction. But in order to understand better how to invest in the sustainable development goals, Visual Iris has translated those goals into nine categories of sustainable goods and services. Companies that provide goods and services in these categories are forward thinking. But let's take Schneider as an example. Schneider was established in 1864, quite a long time ago, as a, uh, as a simple manufacturing company. But in the last couple of years, they understood that the world is moving and they became a leader in providing solution for different goals, all as part of their electric, uh, their electric manufacture. It's not just that they are making a huge impact for public relation purposes, it provides a great revenue growth tool. Here you can see that they are, uh, if we see from the nine pillars, we see that they have different products for four of those categories from access to ICT, access to energy, smart meters, safety equipment, and even to water sanitation. Schneider is a great example that using its impact to leverage opportunities and enjoy growth impact. 
Elal talked about choosing best in class. Schneider is a type of companies uh, company we want. Here's an example of how we look for the best in class from the industrial sector. And we are comparing Schneider versus Amphenol. Amphenol, American company, Schneider is a French company, which are both electric equipment companies that are both multinational with over 25 billion in revenue. We want to invest in Schneider, which we see in the green, what they do. We see, we see that they reduced its, their CO2 emission. They have procedures for work safety and has gender diversity in the board of directors. Furthermore, as mentioned before, it has significant revenue from equipment from the solar fields in remote locations. Schneider delivers on the impact we are looking for. But not just. We see that Schneider also did better financially than Amphenol. Schneider is the green line, Amphenol is the red line. When we are looking back and after this crisis. Schneider is a prime example of a company with a higher ESG and having a higher with a, having a higher SDG allowing them to grow more. More values lead to higher, sorry, more values lead to higher value. But what can ESG and impact help us also with this uh, two challenging crises, um, the current crisis uh, that of the COVID-19 epidemic and climate change crisis that is knocking on our door? The answer is, is resilience. What we see is that companies that are managing the ESG and already have sustainable goods and services are more resilient. Um, we have the information that will allow us to see which companies have the right managerial infrastructure to adopt to climate cha to, to change quickly. During the corona crisis, we see that, we, uh, that the companies that are more resilient are those that have good relationship with their, their employees, that their employees feel obligation to the companies, and even if, they are, even if they are in temporary leave, they will come back. Those companies will health and safety management and those companies with solid relationship with their supply chains, with their suppliers, and know from which suppliers they can rely on. When we want to assess re resilience needed for climate change, we need to look at different parameters that we have, whether they have environmental strategy, uh, energy, water use, uh, and again, supply chain is crucial. ESG allows us to look at the ability to adopt to these changes. These SDG, but th uh, the SDGs allows us to understand which companies are already providing the solution. These are the sectors that are providing the solution for the current crisis, but also those the sect that are the sectors that, according to Visual Iris, will be needed and essential to deal with the climate change crisis. But I want to give you an example of a company that is that took the opportunity and got a lot of points out of it. I want to give you an example of Medtronic, a medical device company that very very early in the crisis understood the position it should take and decided to disclose its patent to the ventilators design and allow whoever needs to manufacture these by themselves. But it didn't really surprise us because Medtronics has the right ESG managerial infrastructure that allows it to believe the way it does. The word crisis in Chinese is a combination of danger and risk and opportunity. ESG and impact give us tools 
to, and help us overcome danger and enjoy opportunities in everyday life, but definitely in this days, this current crisis that we are today and in the future. Thank you. Ella, the floor is yours. Sigal, how are we on time? Can we? Can we, we like, let's try to wrap it up so we can open to Q&A. So maybe final two minutes so we can open for discussion and questions. Is that OK, Ella? Uh, do my best. OK. Um, so uh, basically, what happened was that the world stood still. Everything uh, stopped working, as we know. and. The bright side of this is that uh, governments jumped in and are uh, spreading money everywhere um, as they have in the last crisis. And the, and the financial markets have been responding to that very powerfully. Um, but I think an important point to make, given our current discussion, is that really uh, this money can take two routes. It can take the route of uh, the Green New Deal, where governments will invest huge amounts of money. I mean, we're, the U.S. has promised something like seven trillion dollars to help us um, to help the U.S. exit this crisis uh, without a financial and an economic um, um, additional standstill. And obviously, Europe and other countries have uh, um, put down um, similar sums or relatively uh, in proportion sums of money to help their countries out of this. So how they spend this money is really crucial. And I put here a headline from the New York Times where a, a relatively large list of companies um, asked the, the, the German government, and there is a similar kind of uh, operation happening in Israel, um, to really uh, link exiting this one crisis with not moving us into the next crisis in a, in a rapid way, and um, have whatever uh, uh, budgets that are uh, put into infrastructure and into taking us out of this crisis really be aligned with climate action. And if governments end up doing that, and the U.S. has uh, um, a very um, detailed plan on how to do that, but uh, I think so do we, and Mary, maybe Sherry wants to say a few additional words about that. Uh, but it's not very complicated, and um, so I'll just say two things. We really know what should be done. Uh, philanthropy definitely knows what should be done. Some of you have been lobbying for this for a long time. And the, so, so the other part of it is that if governments actually do this and actually invest the amounts of money and pass the legislation that is needed uh, to give prominence to uh, alternative energy and uh, any other company that really falls into this category of uh, helping the environment, um, co the corporate world will make a lot of money. So if you invest in this area uh, that you've been lobbying for, now that governments, so, you know, even if they don't put huge amounts of money into this, they're very likely to put substantial sums of money into this. And, um, if that's the way uh, it plays out, if we follow those corporates, uh, we're very likely to make a lot of money in the process because if that's where governments are funneling the corporate world, if that's where corporate are, uh, are investing, that's probably where uh, the profits will lie. And that's part of the, the reasoning of the SDG in general, uh, the development goals that the UN has, has put out. Uh, Basically, what they map is they map the areas in which there is huge demand. And companies that will be able to fill that demand are very likely to make a very substantial uh, profit. So this is, this is a really basic rationale of why the investment world is looking at this very, very closely. And uh, 
just another way of saying why now the opportunity is likely very huge. So, you know, if we follow the road that the government uh, lays out, if with our philanthropy and lobby work, we can help uh, move governments in the right direction, and then if corporates follow, or corporates are very likely to follow within uh, the path that the government uh, lays out, and if investors follow, very, or those investors who follow are very likely to make a lot of money. Um, so obviously it's not that simple. And I just wanna highlight one or two potential uh, problems and then- Very have, briefly. <laughs> yeah, very, very briefly. So one is very obvious, right? I mean, we've all seen what happened to oil prices. We all know the extent of uh, politics that is involved in this. And if oil prices, they don't even have to be negative, right? They, oil just has to be very, very cheap for the economics of alternative uh, energy uh, to get twisted. Uh, the chances of this continuing for a, a, a long period of time, it might be noise for the shorter term. The chances that this will be uh, out there for a long period of time is not huge. Um, we wanted to say that, um, um, basically Marla said this, so I, I will just repeat it, that if you insist on ESG and SDG screening, you will probably uh, force your uh, investment advisor into doing better for you, giving you higher returns at lower risk. So you have lots of reasons to uh, be insisting on this. Um, you should probably vet the manager because as, as we showed, every investment manager in the world is now um, um, uh, waving this flag. And really, um, some of us are doing a very good job. Some of us are doing less of a good job. There is a lot of greenwashing within this process. And like any, you know, any professional that you choose, um, you should uh, make sure that they have the database that they need in order to get their job right. Because if they don't invest in the database, the chances of them doing ESG or SDG in any reasonable way is very limited. And this is a very simple question. It's very easy to vet the manager. You just have to know that they have the right uh, database to allow them to do the process. Um, and then like anything else, like any other portfolio that you have, you have to monitor it and you have to make sure that no mistakes were done and no um, uh, shortcuts were taken. Um, and I'm sure you know that anyway and you do that anyway. So those are probably the three things unless uh, Noga or Mala wants to add anything to this. Um, I think this is a good, point in our presentation uh, yeah. to pass it back to you, Siga. Can you um, exit the share screen? Of course I can. Yofi, thank you so much, Elai, Noga, and Marla. I know on the one hand, it's a lot to take in. On the other hand, there's a diverse group here on this call and some people already have a lot of experience and others are more new to this. So we really wanted to start by laying the bedrock to, for all of us to be on the same page in the terms and understanding a little bit about what to do. So thank you everyone and good night and Shabbat Shalom.